Our, our next speaker is Dr. Sarah Federico. Um, <coughs> Uh, she's an assistant member in the Division of Solid Malignancies in the Department of Oncology at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. She currently runs phase one in phase two clinical trials for patients with pediatric solid malignancies. Dr. Federico joined the faculty in 2011 and he has a passion for treating children with advanced solid tumors. Her current efforts focus on neuroblastoma, Ewing sarcoma, and developmental therapeutics. She received her medical degree from Virginia Commonwealth University Medical College of Virginia in Richmond, Virginia, and completed her pediatric internship and residency at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford University Medical Center and did her fellowship at St. Jude. Her talk today is about a new pilot study for high-risk neuroblastoma for COG and updates on St. Jude research. Am I supposed to be finding it? Uh, yeah. Looks like, thank you. <laughs> Just kidding, there's more. <laughs> um, yeah, just hit escape. All right, well, first off, um, thanks for having me here today. I actually haven't been to this meeting before, um, so it's an honor to be here and talking with you guys. And feel free, I'll stick around for the panel uh, discussion. I actually have to get home because I have three little kids, so I won't be here tomorrow, but if you have any questions, you can also always just email me, and Pat has my email address as well. So today what I thought I would do is discuss kind of what we've been doing at St. Jude and then kind of some next steps forward. So we'll make it number five. I think Rajan said it was number four. So we all know that the addition of Chimeric 1418 to the um, end of therapy in a setting of minimal residual disease really established a new standard of care. And so just as a reminder, how does this work? Well, antibody therapy, is, it's been very well described, primarily works through the ADCC. So tumor cell, GD2 present on the tumor cell, you give the monoclonal antibody, you give other agents, cytokines, to rev up the own immune system, like IL-2 and GMCSF, and then you're able to kill tumor cells. So in the US, um, there have been a number of different anti-GD2 monoclonal antibodies in clinical use, anywhere from purely mouse um, antibodies, which have been uh, done at Memorial Sloan Kettering, to the chimeric antibodies uh, using dinatuximab, chimeric 1418, to the children's oncology group that LSU did, um, to a humanized version, and actually there were some trials where this is partnered with IL-2 that were run through trials to the children's oncology group. And then we have a different antibody that we use. And so the antibody that we use at St. Jude is called HU-1418K322A. So for the remainder of this talk, I'll call it HU-1418K. So um, this is a humanized antibody, so different from a chimeric antibody that's mouse and human, this is mostly all human, so actually about 98% human. And so theoretically, there are fewer allergic reactions uh, related to it. One of the issues that you've heard many people talk about, and certainly if your kiddos have received this antibody therapy, you're very well aware of, is that there are a number of um, side effects associated with antibody. And a lot of this, we believe, is actually done through the CDC. We basically, when we give the antibody therapy, it activates complement, and in the activation of complement, you can get increased pain, increased capillary leak, et cetera. So actually what we did at St. Jude is that we identified a single spot in which we felt like that part of the antibody is what activated complement, made a single point mutation, which basically decreases the activation of complement, but does not affect ADCC, which is the primary way that the antibody works. And together, um, this decreases side effects. And uh, just a second on that, we actually did a study, and I didn't include it here, but where we um, have, of course, used the chimeric antibody on 0032, um, and it's a great antibody. We went back and we looked at patients who received 0032 and patients who received HU1418K and just kind of added up all the different pain medications. This was a study that actually one of our pain, our anesthesiologists did as part of the pain team, and it does seem to come with fewer side effects of pain. It's also produced in a rat myeloma cell line where you basically get enhanced ADCC and I didn't include some of the laboratory data that supports that ADCC is better, uh, we feel, with the HU1418K. 
And together, if you take all of these reasons, um, we basically are able to give more of this antibody. Now, what we don't know is, is more better, right? So I'm certainly not gonna stand up here and pitch something that might not be true. No one's been ever, ever able to tease out uh, what the correct dose of antibody is, but we are able to give more of it. So actually, Fariba Naveed uh, completed a study called SJGD2, and this was looking at this antibody therapy just as a single agent, so only given alone. This was done about a decade or so ago. It was kind of a classic phase one study where patients enroll, you give them, there were patients who had recurrent or refractory disease, and Dr. Modi just described that very eloquently, what those patients entail. You give them a dose of antibody, if they tolerate it, you're able to go up uh, to the next dose level. And so when we reached a maximum tolerated dose, an MTD, that dose was 60 milligrams per meter squared per dose. So in comparison, uh, the current dose of the dinatuximab that's used is 17.5 milligrams per meter squared. There were six patients who were treated on this study that actually had a complete or a partial response. So a signal of activity, not a home run, but it's given as a single agent to patients with recurrent or refractory disease, and so this was encouraging to us. So taking this forward then, we thought, well, how can we optimize this antibody therapy? So if we have a really great antibody that looks like it's effective in neuroblastoma, it might have fewer side effects, what can we do? Well, one of the questions was, this was done kind of in the late 2000s, um, was to, can we combine it with uh, chemotherapy? And so by combining it with chemotherapy, you can induce a cytopenia and upregulate the stress ligand expression before giving the antibody therapy. The other question is some of the um, other uh, presentations have identified that natural killer cells are really important. So natural killer cells are a white blood cell. We all have them. And essentially they're um, involved in ADCC. So we think that they're the primary cell that helps with the killing when you give antibody therapy to patients with neuroblastoma. And then finally, can we give IL-2 and GMCSF? So what IL-2 does, IL-2 does a whole bunch of things, but one of the things that IL-2 does is it actually enhances ADCC and it expands NK cells. Um, the GMCSF in these trials basically is done for two things. So one, it augments ADCC, and then the other is that all these patients that are getting chemotherapy, we need to stimulate uh, hematopoiesis and, and the progenitor cells. So out of all these thoughts came this trial, and this is called GD2NK. And what it, GD2NK is, is it's a pilot study where basically we took chemotherapy, we combined it with antibody therapy and natural killer cells in patients with recurrent and refractory neuroblastoma. And I think it's a really important as we go through the next couple of slides that describe this study. This trial was purely done to basically see if there's a signal of activity. Number one is it fees, actually primary objective is, is it feasible? and tolerable, is it safe, basically, to give antibody therapy with chemotherapy in patients who have recurrent or refractory disease? And then number two, does it look like it might be a good idea to take forward into other studies? And so the way this trial was designed is that there were only six courses. Um, and what we did is we chose the agents that are most commonly given to patients who have recurrent or refractory neuroblastoma. Excuse me, those agents include cyclophosphamide and topotecan, arenatecan and temozolomide, and then ifosfamide, carboplatin, and etoposide. So, again, I think that these three combinations are some of the most com common combinations. I think one of the other parents earlier said, well, people just kind of reach into the cabinet and start pulling out chemos. This is kind of that go to. And they've actually all come from different trials, right? So, um, what we also did is with each cycle of chemotherapy, we combined it with the antibody HU1418K322A. And then in alternating cycles, we were testing just to see if it was feasible and tolerable to obtain natural killer cells from a parent and then infuse them into the patient. Other things to highlight here is that um, the dose of the antibody, I told you the maximum tolerated dose of this antibody is a phase one study with 60 milligrams per meter squared. We didn't feel comfortable giving that dose, and so because we were gonna be combining it with chemotherapy, so we decreased the dose to 40 milligrams per meter squared. Again, more than the dinatuximab, and there's some preclinical data that maybe says more is better, but nobody knows that in the patients. And then the IL-2 here, we've heard a lot about the toxicities of IL-2. I totally agree that IL-2 is toxic. But I think when you hear about studies, it's always important to think about doses. 
So the dose of IL-2 that we use in this study and that we're currently using in our high-risk study is a very, very different dose than the dose that's being used or that was used in the Siopin studies. It's actually a sixth of the dose. And this was derived basically from some other studies um, done in the leukemia population at St. Jude in which they also get natural killer cells. And we see that by giving a million cells um, every other day times six, that actually increases NK cell production but doesn't have near the amount of side effects. So again, I want to stop for a second, just pause. The primary objective here is, is it safe and tolerable? So this is kind of an outline as to what a typical course looks like. So I am only going through courses one and two. But basically, classic cyclophosphamide topo TKN given daily times five. Antibody therapy is always started on days two. The antibody therapy that we give on these trials, actually, because it's humanized, we're able to, um, it's better tolerated. So we usually start out with a four-hour infusion rate. For some patients that have uh, reactions, that is oftentimes slowed to eight hours, but usually is able to stop after eight hours. Every once in a while, it has to be run over 16 hours. And then after completing chemotherapy, they would get IL-2 every other day, which unfortunately is a sub-Q injection, and I know that that comes with a whole host of issues. And then GMCSF starts on day seven. For course two, in, in the alternating cycles when patients received um, natural killer cells, the patient's uh, parent uh, would basically go down to our donor center the day before the natural killer cells were to be delivered. They would forese them in our donor center, and the natural killer cells were given on day seven. And these are what the results look like. So 13 patients, really heavily pretreated. So this was not a first uh, recurrent or refractory patient population. And in fact, the median number of prior chemo regimens per patient was three. And when I say chemo regimens, like all induction, transplant, radiation, antibody therapy would count as one. Um, and some patients had had, there was one patient who had only one, and then one patient who had received up to 10. You can see that the majority of patients, 12 of 13, had had prior radiation. 12 of the 13 had had prior transplant. And actually, as Dr. Modi pointed out, a bunch of our patients on this trial had already received antibody therapy. And so the antibody therapy that patients had received here included about half of them with the chimeric antibody, the dinatuximab, and about half of them um, on our phase one study with this same antibody. The sites of disease include, included a lot of bone disease and a lot of bulky disease. So many, many, many of these patients came in with a lot of disease. Marrow disease in about half, nodal disease, and then soft tissues. Together, these patients, 13 patients, completed 65 courses, and we actually saw a response rate of 61.5%. Uh, and so what does response rate mean? It just means who had a PR or better. While being treated, none of the patients actually had progressive disease. Now, a couple of patients had to come off study. So one patient who had had 10 prior treatments, actually, at the end of course one, her platelets just did not recover well. They didn't recover well going into therapy. They didn't recover well after the therapy, and so she met um, a 35-day stopping rule, so she came off. So after they came off study, some of them had progressive disease, but you can see that, again, a glimmer that this is doing something. So three patients had complete responses. One patient had a very good uh, partial response, four with a partial response, and five with stable disease. The other interesting thing that we saw is that there was this really long delayed progression. And so again, on this trial, patients only received six um, cycles of chemotherapy plus antibody therapy. And in a recurrent and a refractory patient population, we typically would give more than that. But this is just the way the trial was designed. And so actually, um, it was very nice. Two years ago um, at PSYOP, Wendy London looked at the um, phase one data from the modern era of the children's oncology group studies and basically found that the median time to progression was about 63 days in patients who enrolled on phase one um, studies. And here we had a much longer time to progression. It was pretty well tolerated, so the most common grade one and two toxicities as to be expected would be pain, and I didn't even mention that, so all of these patients were placed on a PCA, um, just like when you received dinatuximab. There were some patients, like Dr. Modi discussed, that have some blurred vision. They develop an Addy's pupil, and I think it's related to the antibody interacting with the ciliary bodies. Many of the patients did not have very, there were very, very few grade three and four toxicities, except for the hematologic toxicities, and this is really to be expected related to the chemotherapy. So you can see in course three and four, those were the cycles where patients received arenatecan and temozolomide, which generally don't affect your counts as much. 
Um, so a lot of the heme toxicities were not related to antibody therapy and were instead related to the chemo. This is just a sample of a patient. And so this patient came into the trial, had had a number of uh, relapses, had received many other types of therapy, has significant bone disease. So bone disease in the skull, the arm, the humeri, in the spine, the legs, and then after four courses had a complete response. Similar to what Dr. Modi said with the dinatuximab plus serenitecan and temozolomide, a lot of these responses came pretty early. So what about natural killer cell infusions? Well, we were able to just determine in, in a small n, really is it safe and feasible? And it was, it was safe to collect them and safe to give them. What we t attempted to do is there's, and we're not gonna get into it here, but there's a lot to be said about something called cure. And basically you wanna find your natural killer cells that mismatch the patient's natural killer, or the patient's tumor um, as well as you can. So many patients had mismatch, which is a good thing. We are able to give adequate doses of NK cells and we're still trying to sort out that data. And I think it's um, important data, especially like uh, Dr. Lodi was discussing. Uh, there's a lot to be said about um, natural killer cells in the use of antibody therapy. So in the conclusion of this trial, we were basically able to say that giving this antibody with chemotherapy is safe and feasible, that giving NK cells was safe and feasible, and that they demonstrated a signal of activity with some clinically meaningful responses that warranted further investigation. So now I'm gonna go into kind of where we've gone uh, since that time point. So because we saw this signal of activity, because we used a lot of different chemotherapeutics in a patient population that had recurrent disease or refractory disease, what we wanted to know is should we give this therapy to patients who have newly diagnosed uh, neuroblastoma, high-risk neuroblastoma, this is all about high-risk neuroblastoma, high-risk neuroblastoma. And so actually Dr. Furman, Wayne Furman, who is, I know has been at this conference before, so he is the PI of a trial called MB2012, which I'm gonna discuss in just a second. But just thinking about the current treatment approach, and you've seen numerous permutations of this slide today, but it basically comprises of three different uh, treatment sections. So induction, in which you receive a number of different chemotherapy cycles. So primarily the children's oncology group has used six uh, chemotherapy cycles. Consolidation with some sort of transplant. We've heard that there are different ways to do different transplants. Radiation therapy to the primary tumor bed. And then post-consolidation or MRD therapy using um, antibody and cis-retinoic acid. So at St. Jude, what we're currently doing is a trial called MB2012. And like I said, Wayne Furman's the um, lead PI on this. I'm a co-investigator. And so what this trial has specifically done is it's moved this antibody, HU1418K322A, into the induction regimen for high-risk patients. And so the primary objective is actually looking at response um, following two courses. And so I completely agree with Dr. Cohn when she was discussing um, the need for randomized trials. But randomized trials are born from smaller trials where we see signals of activity and then we know what we should take forward into randomized trials. And so oftentimes we're left with doing historical controls. And so when we were designing this trial, what we were looking at is, okay, well let's pick the induction regimen that's currently the most widely used induction regimen in the US, which is uh, the ongoing regimen run through Children's Oncology Group, comprising of six courses of chemotherapy. Um, there was a pilot study that was done using these six courses called AMBL 02P1. And at that, in that pilot, what they were able to say is after you give the first two courses of cyclophosphamide and topotecan, that there is a response rate when you measure disease response with scans of 40%. And so for this primary objective, that's what we chose to look at is this time period after the first two cycles of chemotherapy. In this trial, what we go on to give is actually the antibody with each cycle of chemotherapy. And so just as described in the um, prior pilot study, basically chemotherapy always starts on day one and antibody therapy always starts on day two and is given daily times four. Patients are then transplanted. Uh, we chose to go with Bumel because at that time Europe had released uh, the data, the Cyopen group had given, shown their data that showed that Bumel might be more effective than CEM. And what we wanted to look at here is, well, can you also give antibody therapy following transplant? Um, when we think of transplant, we think of completely wiping out somebody's immune system. And so that doesn't really make that much sense to give antibody therapy during that time point. 
unless you infuse parental NK cells, which we believe are the primary effectors. And so patients get their transplant, they get their high-dose chemotherapy, they get antibody therapy, and then if there's a healthy parent that's willing and able, then they donate parental NK cells at that time. Patients then go on to get standard radiation therapy, followed by pretty standard um, post-consolidation MRD type therapy. And the only thing that we looked at different on this trial is that we're escalating the dose of the antibody at the end of therapy. So we started with a dose which is similar to denetuximab dosing on 0032, and if the first 10 patients tolerated it, then we are going up, and we've gone up safely, nobody's had a problem. During this trial, patients also receive cytokines, so they get IL-2 every other day times six, the low dose, and GMCSF. And so again, thinking about the primary objective um, endpoint, the way this trial was designed is it was designed as a two-stage group a sequential design, which essentially allows for a stopping point. So the last thing we want to do is hurt patients or give them inferior therapy that doesn't work. And so this allowed for stopping if uh, there was lack of anti-tumor activity. And so like I said, based on the prior pilot study that was from the earlier 2000s, the same two courses of cyclophosphamide and topotecan for high-risk, newly diagnosed high-risk patients was 40%. Uh, Dr. Park recently presented at ASCO that the trial uh, showing that tandem transplant is it leads to improved EFS also showed though that we know that that 40% after the first two cycles of therapy holds true. It's basically on the big trial that was just done, 650 some odd patients. There's a, a response rate after the first two cycles of about 40. And so what we said is that if we're gonna give chemotherapy, and then we're gonna give antibody therapy, which clearly has side effects, we don't wanna move the bar just a little bit, we wanna move the bar by 20% or better. And so the sample size was calculated in an alternative response rate of 60%. So basically, can we move it by 60% after, or by 20% after the first two cycles? And so actually, we are still accruing patients, but what happened is we reached that 20 patient number where we had to stop and look at the data to make sure that there was uh, not causing, that we weren't causing problems for the patients and that we weren't seeing fewer responses. And when we did that, Wayne Furman recently presented these results. What we found is that actually our response rate compared to the pilot was that 16 out of 20% of the pa 20 patients had a response. And so using the same identical chemotherapy, cyclophosphamide and topotecan, but in MB2012 adding antibody therapy in high-risk patients, the response rate was 80%, and it has a p-value um, that's a good p-value. Uh, when you read stats. So when we look at what that means, um, this actually is more than uh, the 20, first 20 patients. These are the first 34. But when we look at the primary tumor volume after the second course of therapy, just to orient you, zero is baseline when patients enroll. If bars were going up, then that would mean that patients were having progressive disease or increasing size of their tumors. As bars go down, then that correlates with the percentage of tumor shrinkage of the primary tumor after the second course of therapy. So I think you can appreciate that all of these patients are having pretty significant uh, benefits. And it's not just after the first two courses. At the end of induction, we're seeing higher uh, response rates compared to the same, again, historical control, and that has faults, um, but to the same chemotherapeutic regimens. So um, where we're at with that study is that it was, we were going to an NF42, um, very encouraging results. Patients are still being enrolled. We're actually at 41. Um, I didn't even get into the, where this antibody, this is an antibody that's just available at St. Jude, and so it's manufactured at St. Jude. We're actually um, amending the study to add another 20 patients where we can get a better look at event-free survival because the study was not initially designed to assess event-free survival. We feel okay amending the study at this time point because we're not even at the two-year uh, off therapy time point yet, and so, uh, and we haven't looked at all the other patients. We just looked at that interim stopping uh, time point to see, so that's where things are going there. But as Dr. Modi just discussed, that kind of these trials, and when we looked at our data for MB2012, we looked at this this past fall, and that's when he actually got up in the children's oncology group meeting and presented the phase two study, which you just saw, showing that denetuximab plus chemotherapy 
for patients who have recurrent or refractory neuroblastoma works. And so as he just walked through, um, that was a pick the winner trial. Forgive me because that's actually nine and that should say 53, apologize, cut from the wrong place. But basically they identified that arenatecan, temozolomide plus dinatuximab was safe, feasible, and had clinically meaningful responses. So I think when you start looking at all these things together, it makes us all pretty excited that chemotherapy plus antibody therapy in um, patients with high-risk neuroblastoma might be a really great thing. So that has led to the final trial, which I'll talk about, which is a dinatuximab induction pilot proposal. So actually, I approached Dr. Park in the fall, so we've got to do this study um, and open it at sm a small number of institutions and look at dinatuximab plus chemo and newly diagnosed patients. And the reason we need to do that, there are a couple of reasons. Number one, right now, HU1418K, I'm a big believer in the antibody that we use. I think that we see fewer side effects. We're able to give higher doses. I mean, I'm a proponent, right? Totally skewed. I am biased, right? Um, for sure. But the problem with it is that it's only available at St. Jude right now. Right? And so that is not applicable to all the patients in the country. And so what we really need to do is we need to look at the antibody that is available to all the patients in the country, dinatuximab, and see if we give it with induction chemotherapy if that leads to improved responses. So basically what we're looking at is adding dinatuximab plus GMCSF. We've chosen to eliminate the IL-2 based on some of the other data to induction chemotherapy and just ask the question, just like we did with the first trial I presented, is it feasible and is it tolerable in patients with newly um, diagnosed high-risk disease? And so this is what it looks like. What you'll notice is that there are only gonna be five induction uh, cycles um, in this pilot program. That's because Megan Granger through the Children's Oncology Group just ran a pilot study using five cycles um, of chemotherapy and actually the response at the end of induction was essentially the same as a response to six cycles. So because of the new data which supports tandem transplant and potentially uh, leading to more uh, chemotherapy obviously in tandem transplant, we've elected to actually only give five cycles of chemotherapy. So what we're doing in this pilot trial is that we're gonna add dinatuximab to courses three, four, and five followed by a tandem transplant, radiation, and then a post-consolidation therapy as is normally given. Now, one could ask, well, that doesn't make any sense because at St. Jude, you're giving antibody therapy with courses one and two. Why are you changing it up? And there are a couple of reasons. Number one, um, and probably the, one of the most important reasons is that I told you that dinatuximab comes with more side effects and patients who come in with newly diagnosed high-risk disease, have a lot of bulky disease, can oftentimes come in pretty sick with pleural effusions, et cetera. And so there's some concern that patients wouldn't be able to tolerate it with the first two courses. So of course we need to be safe about this, and so that's why we're omitting it from the first two cycles in this pilot. The second reason, and for the sake of time, we don't have a lot of time, but I'm happy to talk about it later, um, is that you can, and I think Dr. Lodi or someone, um, alluded to the development of the antibody against the antibody. So for the chimeric antibody, that's called HACA. And so there's always this risk that as you give antibody therapy, your own body develops an antibody to the antibody and then um, limits your ability to give it later. And so because we are gonna be forecing patients, um, we chose to eliminate it from the first two cycles and then at the time that they get back their stem cells and maybe if they developed HACA during this time, they wouldn't have as much around. And so with that, um, there have been a ton of people at St. Jude uh, who have uh, played major roles in these studies. I really wanna thank Wayne Furman, who like I said, is currently the PI of MB2012, Alberto Papo, who's my boss and main mentor, and then Alice Yu um, has been, was involved significantly in the design of this trial. Dr. Sondell, he helps with all of the evaluations of HAHA and some of the other studies that are ongoing. And then now with this dinatuximab uh, trial and pilot that's going forward in the uh, children's oncology group, uh, Dr. Park has been uh, one of the main drivers of that. And then of course, the patients and their families. And these two patients are patients of mine that I first um, took care of uh, during my first year of fellowship. And I fell in love with them, and then I fell in love with the idea that I have got to do something for neuroblastoma. So with that, um, I'll take questions. Thank you. Does anyone have questions? Go ahead. 
Just a real quick, early on you mentioned that um, there was a reaction to the pupil. One, yeah. Do you, what was that that caused that? Yeah, so we think that there's some issues with the antibody and binding to the pupillary bodies that allow uh, don't allow the pupil to constrict correctly. And so it's really common that, um, and I don't know the comparison, I don't know actually how much uh, they've seen this with dinatuximab. We see it a lot with HU1418K, HU but patients will get pretty dilated pupils during the time of therapy, oftentimes have blurred vision. Some of them actually do require glasses, and the glasses seem to help. Sometimes after the cessation of the antibody therapy, that gets better, their pupils return, but there have been some that continue to have, I'm looking at one mom whose son definitely has, but uh, that continue to have dilated pupils um, and continue to require glasses. So that, that could be considered a as of right now, a permanent or semi-permanent side effect of the Yeah, antibody. usually it's reversible in okay. most cases. And I think we just need more data. Yeah. It'll be really interesting um, to see the percentage and kind of get a better sense of the true percentage with um, the MB2012 uh, trial that's ongoing right now um, because I think we'll have a little bit better sense. And I think from what you explained, theoretically, there should be less side effects of that case. With yeah, and we definitely, so I didn't even really touch on that, but we definitely see um, less pain for sure. So day one of the first course is always hard, right? And But there are a lot of our patients that as you continue to give more uh, courses of antibody, especially in that maintenance phase, they might not even need their pain pumps anymore and just be able to get by with a PR and doses as needed. Lauren? I might have just missed this, but did St. Jude do a study comparing their antibody to the Chimera CH1418? No, no, no. So nobody's done that study yet. It would be a huge study to do, right? And so what we, what we need to do, and this is a really good question that gets at this, and this is why we're running this other pilot, is that um, we need to finish this study, see what it looks like, the early results are promising, right? But we don't know what if those continue to pan out, right? Does response, early response uh, correlate to an improved EFS? I don't know. We'll have to see. And then what we really need to do, too, is also see what the response is to the dinatuximab plus induction chemo. And um, currently, there are no plans to do a head-to-head -head trial because I think we need to answer those questions first. Yeah. Other questions? Anyone else? Great. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Federico. We'll take a short 15-minute break. There's some prep.